boys and the hood. Spit masks, spit hoods, spit guards, whatever you wish to call them, they are a bag that's put over somebody's head through which air can permeate more easily than liquid. The intention being to prevent fluids from the mouth of a detained person being projected at those who are in the vicinity, whilst allowing communication, eye contact and observations to still be made. Now we've had a death involving a spit hood on the 6th of May 2009, following alleged violence and a subsequent arrest a Mr. Pluck was spitting, so a spit hood was used before he was transported to a police station. At the police station, he was restrained in a cell, strip searched, and put face down on a mattress, which was placed on the cell floor. Within minutes, Mr. Pluck was observed from outside the cell as being clearly unwell. Officers entered the cell and attempts were made to resuscitate him. Paramedics were called, and following attending Peterborough District Hospital, Mr. Pluck was pronounced dead at 6.38. Now, the IPCC made a number of recommendations as a result of a subsequent investigation. Officers should be adequately trained in the use of specialist equipment such as spit hoods. All emergency medical equipment should be checked regularly so it's fit for purpose and relevant officers are trained in its correct use. So, spit hoods are only used by police officers, right? No, wrong. These items are being used under different guises and different aliases by many different organisations. So are you a school, care home or otherwise who's considering using one of these items or are you already using one? Well, here are some thoughts on the legal guidelines. Morally and ethically, organisations should be on their own to decide about this one. Is it a human rights issue? It's definitely a reasonableness argument. One discussion I had where I've heard a comment I'll never forget was with a barrister when I had a speaker slot at a 2010 education conference. And he said, the word reasonable is why we have a 40 billion pound a year legal system in the UK. Now, did I say schools are using these? Yes, I did. Schools are using spit hoods on children, on these young vulnerable members of society who are forming a view on what the world is, learning life lessons, and who are copying our behaviors. Now, to me, this was very contradictory to the message of my childhood of not putting plastic bags over your head. And I sat in disbelief as I read that this was happening and that there are parents out there having to deal with the aftermath of their child being treated in this extreme manner. As a provider of training and consultancy in mechanical and physical restraint, the use of force with children and the choice to deploy such a, a device intrigued me. As a father, its use horrified me. And as a health and safety practitioner advising on work equipment, well, it alarmed me. Isn't a bag on someone's head a bit zero dark 30? Orange jumpsuits in Guantanamo Bay and for the top prize in family fortunes, the majority of our audience said, torturous. Well, here is article three in all its glory. Prohibition of torture, inhumane and degrading treatment. Treatment that arouses in the victim a feeling of fear, anguish and inferiority, capable of humiliating and debasing the victim and possibly breaking his or her physical or moral resistance. Dug by name, dig by nature. So I did some digging. And here's a brief insight into the idea behind such products and some of the implications from a health and safety and training point of view. I will be following this post up at a later date and um, pending responses from yourselves after this post has been shared. So I made a trip south. After making contact with my network, I was very kindly invited to see a spit guard course in person, which I attended some time ago with the National Police Force. I was able to speak to the police trainers, watch the new police recruits in training, and those existing officers who were due to have their annual refreshers all participate in this and other aspects of their use of force training. I relayed to the police trainers and to the author of their spit guard program in person some of the accounts I've come across where spit hoods or similar devices have been used on children and those with learning disabilities. The response was that they wouldn't expect officers to knowingly use a spit hood on a child. So as for the product, I have got many of these items now after I've bought them off the internet quite easily. And uh, I hope you can see that it's starting to unfold to me more than just a bag to stop spitting. It's far more than that and rightly so carries far more implications and regulations. Now this was one of 12 which the force I spoke to reviewed and then chose due to it being the most fit for purpose, which is good practice. I've worn it, felt claustrophobic and it looks slightly bank robberish. I've handled it, felt like nylon and a bit kinky, 
kinky bad not good and I read the instructions or to be correct what should be by law the manufacturer's data sheet and here are a few of the core requirements for the device which are listed on the sticker the subject should be properly controlled prior to applying the spit hood subject should not be left unattended secure fit allows eye contact at all times use only once discard properly and develop through intensive field testing training in how to use a spit hood training to put a bag on a head please and maybe some of you start thinking it's a bag intended to go on a head so put bag on head then when spitting ceases take bag off, bag off head well not quite staff should by law receive training how to use any equipment this is an absolute statutory requirement and it states under regulation 9 every employer shall ensure that all persons who use work equipment have received adequate training for the purpose of health and safety and that's from the pure regulations 1998 and just to clarify from the NEBOSH national general certificate it states on page 18 this duty does not allow choice and takes no allowance of how much an employer can afford. Having observed the course instructing participants, police officers, in how to apply a spit hood, I made note of many safety practices and protocols which have been factored in to reduce the risks associated with applying such a device to a controlled subject. In the case of this particular course, I observed the subject to be under control and in mechanical restraints, handcuffs and not to be held in a face down prone position for any prolonged period of time. The emphasis was on bringing the person into a standing or kneeling position or on their side as soon as possible. There was an emphasis on medical emergency drills and vital checks to be made throughout the spit hood's use. And the author spent eight months developing the spit hood training program and was operational and received feedback from others using the equipment throughout. Without training or solid guidance, staff would be at risk of increasing the risk of positional asphyxia and position-related asphyxia. Speaking with a supplier of spit hoods, after I travelled over to the HQ of an international company, I met with their CEO, who I must say extended his hospitality in the usual excellent manner and laid on the finest cheeses, chutney and salami known to man. After the catch-up, I aired my views on the use of these items and we discussed the kinds of scenarios where he would be satisfied with the use of spit hoods being deployed. Violence, contractable diseases, blood, saliva-borne bacteria, police forces, people attempting to swallow evidence were all highlighted. Schools and children's services didn't come to it. And the CEO explained that if somebody did contact him with the intention of using them on a children, um, he'd first signpost them to other professionals for guidance, effectively turning the business away. Now, unfortunately, as a relatively easy to produce item made from readily available materials, if people ask, some providers might not be so stringent. And I have four examples of spit hoods laid on my coffee table at home in front of me, which I purchased from fishing through a few search engines and by sending out electronic payments. Now I wanted to gain a subject specific professional's opinion on this and I spoke to a well-respected expert witness on the subject. I was interested in gaining the opinion of this person as he's been involved in some high profile investigations and has, has some very real concerns himself about testing and training of such items. He very kindly shared with me some of his research. One, Health and safety advice was that anyone using these would need to be able to evidence fit for purpose testing and training to fulfill their section six obligation. Two, one supplier said to him, with well, a sticker on the front of training, and we've sold thousands of these without a problem. Section six is concerned with the duties of those who manufacture, and it covers safety design and testing, provision of information on use and conditions essential to health and safety, and information about new and serious risks which come to light is to be provided to those supplied. So let's look at a scenario. A person has died with a spit hood on his or her head. A question that could be asked, in line with the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, evidence that the testing has been done on this device that include breathing capacity and testing data through blood, vomit, spit, etc. How long can one be applied for? Medical implications. Has there been a medical review? By who? And who authored the training pack? And how was their competency measured? Having read several risk assessments of different establishments using spit hoods, there is a consistent approach to reducing the risk of injury. Don't place a hood on a subject until they've been restrained 
and handcuffed. Now, I'd be intrigued to see a risk assessment that shows the use of such a hood without the person being mechanically restrained. The overriding principle for police officers using a spit hood is that spitting has potentially serious health risks for officers and the public, and the hoods provide valuable protection following arrest until placing a person in a cell. So this model has an end in sight and a purpose, which is to successfully detain a person so they may face justice. What is the purpose and sense of urgency then to hood up a child in a classroom? A behaviour management tool, punishment, personal gratification, are there no other alternatives? Really? If to prevent the risk of spitting, staff are expected to use spit hoods, what then should we do if a child tries to bite another pupil or a member of staff? Should we muzzle them?